Hi everybody, welcome back to Philosophy of the Paranormal with me, Dr. Josh Redstone. And today's lecture is all about ghosts, or as I've subtitled the PowerPoint slides for this lecture, on communicating with the dead. For reasons I'll discuss in a moment, um, this is the aspect of uh, ghost lore that I've decided to focus on this time. However, uh, this obviously is not exhaustive, right? Um, we could talk about other aspects of paranormal investigation or perhaps, uh, you know, things like ghost hunting. Um, but I have decided not to do that today. Although that would make a fruitful avenue of discussion for um, perhaps a special topics lecture. So do keep that in mind as you're thinking about uh, how to, uh, how, uh, what kind of um, suggestions you want to make for the special topics lectures. In any case, um, uh, I'm going to keep this lecture focused on communicating with the spirits of the dead or ghosts. Before we do that, though, I want to recall a few, um, a few things that I've mentioned in previous lectures, a few things concerning metaphysics uh, and mind, which I guess I haven't really talked about very much yet, but it'll be important to keep in mind for this lecture. So on to the metaphysics, right? Um, recall, if you will, uh, and this is all on slide number three if you want to follow along, recall this idea that I introduced earlier um, called uh, metaphysical naturalism. So metaphysical naturalism is a metaphysical theory, and metaphysics deals with the study of reality, right? So what exists and what does not exist, um, and what do the things, uh, the things that exist, uh, what are they like, right? What are their properties? Um, things like this. This is what metaphysics is all about. And metaphysical naturalism is the view that only naturalistic things exist. So supernatural things do not exist. So no gods, no spirits, no ghosts. Um, the mind, which many people associate with the soul, um, is contingent upon the brain, uh, realized in the brain, supervenes on the brain. There's many different ways of putting this, but basically it means that minds are natural phenomena. They aren't supernatural. They aren't uh, reducible to souls or spirits, or they're not explainable by appeal to souls or spirits, right? So this particular kind of naturalism, as I mentioned before, is typically uh, associated with substance monism. Now, metaphysical naturalism doesn't necessarily imply substance monism or vice versa, but nowadays most naturalists are substance monists in that they are what we call physicalists or materialists. What that means is that everything that exists, and again I've mentioned this in previous lectures, it means that everything that exists is physical or you know matter. Not just matter but energy and the properties associated with matter and energy. That's all that exists in the universe according to substance monism which is a naturalistic type of worldview, right? The only thing that exists is the universe, natural stuff in the universe. There's nothing outside of that, like, uh, like a supreme deity kind of thing, like the Judeo-Christian God. Uh, souls, none of that exists outside of the universe. Everything exists in the universe, and here's where we get to the physicalism. Everything in the universe is physical in nature, matter and energy and that kind of thing. Right? And this can be contrasted with a different view. That is, of course, substance dualism. Some of you are probably familiar with substance dualism. And, of course, substance dualism is primarily discussed uh, when we talk about figures like René Descartes, who was a 17th century philosopher. Uh, you know, he's associated with radical skepticism. Um, he, he tried to establish what he could be certain about by systematically doubting uh, first his own senses and then a priori truths, um, you know, the, his, his experiences. Uh, he doubted everything, even the existence of God, which was um, a risky thing to do in his day to try to establish what he could be certain about. And Descartes reasoned that there are actually two substances that exist, uh, two um, kinds of stuff, if you want. Um, as opposed to, you know, monists who say there's only one kind of stuff and it's physical stuff. 
Descartes said there's two kinds of stuff. There's uh, res extensa, that's Latin for extended substance. This is what we mean by matter and physical stuff. And there's res cogitans, or uh, thinking substance, or the mind. So the mind is non-physical, it doesn't take up any space, and it is what explains our ability to reason, our conscious experience, our morality and our ethics. Basically, this res cogitans was the immaterial soul, uh, as that concept is understood in um, Christianity. Um, so, Descartes is saying we've got two substances. There's physical stuff, res extensa, that's what our bodies are made of. And there's res cogitans, that's the mind, or also the soul. And uh, the soul uh, controls the body, uh, but does not depend on the body. Uh, the rational soul in particular, which is where reason and everything um, was thought to come from, uh, according to Descartes, uh, which is actually an old idea. All of this goes back to Plato, who had the idea of the tripartite soul, where we had a rational soul, uh, which kind of was how reason uh, worked. But Plato also thought we had a... Um, we had two other souls. Uh, we had a spirited soul, which was the seat of our emotions or our passions, and we had an appetitive soul, which was the seat of, you know, biological drives like hunger, thirst, the desire for sex, uh, or, or to, to, to seek pleasure and avoid pain. Uh, that's the appetitive soul. So, um, <clears throat> Descartes associating res extensa or extended substance with the body and res cogitans with the rational soul or the mind. And of course, being a Christian in the Jesuit tradition, actually, Descartes thought that the uh, immaterial soul and the mind were really the same thing. So, um, again, this is an old idea, but we can, we can connect it, I guess, um, probably best with thinkers like Plato and more recently with rationalist thinkers like René Descartes. Now, Descartes' um, substance dualism does pose some problems, right? I mean, um, we have the mind-body interaction problem, a very famous problem. How, how does the mind control the body, and how do, um, say, sense impressions uh, coming from the senses, which are uh, realized by, you know, organs and nerves and things in the body, how does that make it into the mind, right? If it's non-material, if the mind is non-material and the body is material, that's the mind-body problem. How does the mental and physical interact? So we won't talk um, too much more about many of the other problems inherent in Descartes. Um, some of them are not really relevant to this class, but discussing uh, dualism is a good way for us to get into our discussion of ghosts. And you might be wondering, as I've kind of um, rhetorically framed it on the beginning of slide four, what does all of this even have to do with ghosts anyway? Well, um, think of it this way. A ghost, um, you know, refers, by and large, the way we use this word ghost, at least in the literal sense, refers to the spirit of a deceased person, right? Um, and we have reports of uh, ghost hauntings that date back to antiquity. But of course, nowadays, um, there are still people who believe that um, hauntings occur, that there are poltergeists, um, or that they might be visited by the spirits of dead relatives or dead friends, or, um, as we'll talk, talk about today, uh, that we might even be able to communicate with the spirits of the dead. So... Ghost refers to a deceased person's spirit. Uh, interestingly, ghost um, and the German word geist are cognate. That means, um, if one word is cognate with another word, if these words are cognates, that means that they descend from a common word. You know, a, a word in a ancestor language, for example, um, an ancestor language of English and German. So in English, ghost usually refers to the spirit of a deceased person. In German, geist can also mean that, as is evidenced by the word poltergeist, right? Um, but uh, geist can also mean spirit, and interestingly, it can also mean mind. So there's just a nice little linguistic uh, factoid for you, right? Um, there is an association between 
ghosts and spirits and the mind. We can find that when we look into um, metaphysical discussions like Descartes, uh, Descartes' discussion of substance dualism. We can also find it when we kind of look into the etymology of different words, like words that are cognate, like geist and ghost. Now, um, what's also interesting here is that certain materialist philosophers have used terms like this um, to express that there is no soul in, in the Cartesian sense, right? I mean, if we're to take Descartes literally at his word, what he seems to be saying is that our body is like a machine. And indeed, this analogy between the body and uh, automatic machines of the day, like clockwork me mechanisms or automata, uh, we talked about automata last time, were very common. Uh, Descartes does this. Um, a number of other thinkers do this. Thomas Hobbes is another example, although Hobbes was a materialist. And Hobbes, uh, well, not just a materialist, but probably also an atheist. Hobbes would have thought the mind worked like a machine as well, whereas Descartes said it's just the body that's like a machine. The mind that controls it is the soul. Uh, in any case, Gilbert Ryle in the 20th century, a materialist philosopher, uh, famously remarked that uh, there is no ghost in the machine, uh, you know, in an effort to kind of highlight what he thought was wrong with Descartes' way of thinking about the mind and about the body and about um, the metaphysics of these two, and about how an immaterial soul or mind is supposed to interact with a material body. So that's where that ghost in the machine comes from, and that means um, there is no immaterial soul. It means the mind, whatever it is, must be explainable in terms of physical processes. So, um, Questions about ghosts um, are interesting to paranormal researchers, but they should also be interesting to philosophers because um, it raises the question, uh, you know, uh, of, of substance dualism versus some variety of substance monism, like physicalism. So it's very pertinent. Yeah, you know, it's very, uh, excuse the pun, but it fits with the spirit of this class very well, right? So, um, you know, a paranormal researcher or a parapsychologist isn't the only person who ought to be interested in talking about ghosts. Philosophers ought to be interested in talking about the notion of ghosts at the very least, I think. Now, whether you believe in ghosts or not uh, probably tells you something about your own metaphysics. I think those of you in this class who do not believe that uh, there are ghosts are probably physicalists right? Because how could there be ghosts, right? You would probably explain um, reported hauntings and things like this in terms of, uh, you know, some kind of naturalistic explanation, like, you know, there is no ghost, it's just um, the wind blowing or an old creaky building or somebody was mistaken about what they saw, something like that, right? So, um, if you do believe in ghosts, though, um, and you're not familiar with substance dualism, I invite you to consider whether or not you may in fact be a dualist. Uh, you may think that there are different substances, two different substances, uh, the physical and the mental. And perhaps the mental uh, is, you know, in some way the soul. Um, and perhaps that soul can survive death. I do not believe this, mind you, and I'm not advocating one way or another for what you should or should not believe. I'm just saying that you can use this as a kind of a thought experiment to work out where you sit metaphysically when it comes to uh, what kinds of stuff exist, whether just physical stuff exists or whether physical and non-physical things exist, right? And if we did find that ghosts were real, um, that would have some pretty powerful implications for, um, for science and philosophy, right? Um, the existence of ghosts would show that materialism is false, um, and probably also that metaphysical naturalism is false. Uh, then again, that's debatable. One could always argue that, um, you know, perhaps there are non-physical things, but that these things are part of the natural universe. So, um, it might, on the other hand, just show that we don't really understand the universe very well. Um, you know, uh, ghosts might move from this topic of paranormal or supernatural investigation into scientific 
uh, explanation. There are, there are episodes of, like, uh, Star Trek that do this kind of thing, right? Where someone's consciousness is somehow separated from their body and uh, gets into a computer or into another life form or floats around and tries to communicate with the, you know, the crew or something, right? But this is always treated naturalistically, right? You know, they get their tricorders out and scan things and it turns out it's some kind of quantum molecular nanoparticles from subspace or whatever, right? So, you know, it doesn't necessarily imply anything supernatural, but um, these are just kind of imaginative ways to imagine which ways these kinds of debates might go if we got, uh, if we found some kind of interesting evidence for the existence of ghosts. Um, but, as we'll see in this lecture, um, I am very skeptical about whether such evidence such evidence exists, and we'll consider that uh, as we talk about the idea of communicating with ghosts or spirits of the dead. So, there are many ways we could talk about ghosts, right? As I say on slide five. We could talk about uh, hauntings in more details, poltergeists. Um, I, I think one thing that would be really interesting to do for a special topics lecture would be to talk about ghost hunting. Um, this is just a weird... Um, this is a weird pseudoscientific area that is nonetheless kind of fun to look at because um, it serves as a good opportunity to learn, on the one hand, how scientific investigation is supposed to work by looking at a case of when it's not working properly, when it's not being done the way it's supposed to be done. Um, and it's also interesting to take a look at because um, it tells us something interesting about how our own minds work. And I suspect we'll get into this a little bit when we talk about ESP for the next lecture. In any case, today I'm going to talk about the idea of communicating with the deceased. Talking to the dead uh, people's ghosts and spirits and so forth. So mediumship and spiritualism and all of that nice stuff. That's what we'll be talking about today. So we'll be asking if there is evidence uh, that the soul can survive death and... If it does, can it communicate with the living? Is there any evidence for this stuff? Well, obviously we can't have an exhaustive survey of the evidence, but we shall take um, as comprehensive a survey as we can, given the time that we have to do it. So let's get started now. Okay, so we'll start by taking a look at mediumship and spiritualism, which starts off on slide number six. Now, for this material, I've mostly drawn from chapters 21, the beginning of chapter 21, as well as the end of chapter 9 in Susan Blackmore's book, Consciousness, an Introduction. This is a really interesting book for a couple of reasons. Um, number one, Susan Blackmore was a parapsychologist, as I mentioned before, and it no longer is, but she still devotes quite a lot of discussion to abnormal psychology, and I think it's really cool. I'm a bit of a fan I guess is what I'm trying to say. And the other cool thing uh, is that this book is all about consciousness and um, some of what we're talking about in this class does bear, um, does bear on consciousness studies as well. We're going to finish um, chapter 21 in this book. Um, the parts I'm not lecturing on today from that chapter, I will lecture on for our lecture on ESP. And I hope to draw out some of these connections during that lecture. But in any case, uh, this is a very interesting book, and if you're interested in taking a look at it, uh, you can get it for free from the Carleton Library, although I have provided the necessary chapters on CU Learn. But uh, do check it out if you're interested in consciousness or how weird abnormal events, um, such as those that might be studied by parapsychologists, might figure into consciousness studies. <clears throat> Okay, so we're going to talk about how mediumship and spiritualism got started in the United States in the beginning of the 19th century. So in 1848, in Hydesville, New York, there were these two sisters, uh, Kate and Margretta. And they claimed that they heard these raps, raps coming from uh, the end of their bed. Now this is 1848, so this word raps uh, doesn't mean funky fresh rhymes like it does today. What it actually means is like a you know, like a knocking sound, like rap, 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 tap, tap, like that, right? So 
So these sisters claimed they heard uh, these raps coming from the end of their bed. And they claimed to have invented a kind of code, you know, like uh, two taps for yes, one for no kind of thing. And claimed that they were actually communicating with the spirit of a dead man whose body was buried underneath of their house. So word began to spread, as you can imagine, of these sisters who were communicating with these spirits. And soon other people um, began to come to them uh, and, well, offered, offered them money <laughs> to communicate with spirits of the deceased. Um, they would also give public demonstrations, you know, travel around demonstrating their purported ability to communicate with the dead. And needless to say, a lot of people were skeptical from the start. Um, but nobody really had a good explanation of, of uh, at least among the skeptics, no one had a good explanation of how the Fox sisters were accomplishing what they were accomplishing. You know, some people suspected fakery, but... Um, they didn't know how it was being faked. And of course, believers maintained that the Fox sisters really were communicating with the dead and that the spirits were using these uh, mediumistic raps, right, to communicate. I think it would be much clearer if uh, these spirits were able to use funky fresh rhymes to communicate, but alas. Now, um, one thing that bears mentioning here is that um, we still can't kind of have an interaction problem here, right? If you're, if you take this report as credible that the, the Fox sisters were really communicating with the dead and the dead, you know, ghosts, spirits, whatever, are some kind of non-physical substance, how is it that it is interacting with the physical world, right? So it's not a mind-body interaction problem, but it's a mind-world interaction problem. How is it that a non-physical entity like a ghost can make that noise. It's another problem that we're kind of confronted with right off the bat. In any case, um, the believers in the Fox sisters continue to believe, and this story kind of kicked off the uh, spiritualist craze of the 19th century in America and in Europe, especially England, but also on continental Europe. Now, in 1888, the Fox sisters actually went public saying that they were frauds and they demonstrated how they produced these raps. They actually did it by cracking the joints of their toes against the frame of their bed, making a kind of popping sound, right? They actually later retracted this confession, but most of the skeptics of the day considered the matter settled. They said, well, they've admitted to being frauds, so they must be frauds, which... I have to admit, I'm fairly sympathetic to. But nonetheless, this craze picked up. Uh, there was a massive craze in medianship, uh, seances, spiritualism in the 19th century. And this eventually led to psychical research uh, that we looked at in uh, my lecture on parapsychology and the paranormal. You know, the um, Society for Psychical Research and so on and so forth, and eventually parapsychology, all because of this craze in spiritualism. Now, um, probably the height of spiritualism, as I say on slide seven here, was at the height, uh, or rather the, the height was at the end of the 19th century. So spirit mediums were widespread in Europe and the United States here, and as I mentioned, often what they would do is hold something called a seance, right? Here, people would sit in a circle around a table. I'll put a picture up here so you can see. Um, so they sit, they sit at this round table, place the hand on the table, and the table would move. Um, and the medium would often claim that this was a spirit attempting to communicate. So uh, here the idea is that no one is actually consciously moving the table. The table's moving on its own, right? Uh, even though everyone's hands are on it. It'd be weird if the table moved without anyone's hands on it, really. But uh, Seances often took place in dark rooms or poorly lit rooms, perhaps just a few candles. And people would also report feeling like cold breezes on their uh, skin, you know, that maybe make the hair on your neck stand on end. Um, they reported hearing voices, maybe feeling touches, seeing objects being moved without anyone touching them. Um, some mediums even apparently oozed this weird grayish translucent substance, which they called ectoplasm uh, during seances. Um, and this... Uh, served to convince a lot of people that these uh, that these mediums were not fraudulent. 
So an example of one such medium is Eusapia Palladino. She was from Napoli, an orphan from Napoli in Italy. And she, according to reports, could apparently levitate herself and other objects. She could materialize extra limbs from nowhere. Um, she could move furniture with her mind. Um, but, uh, similar to the Fox sisters, she was caught cheating. She didn't admit to cheating, but she was caught cheating in 1895. Some psychical researchers at the time, though, thought that she could genuinely perform acts of psychokinesis, that is, uh, the extra motor movement or influence of objects in the environment around you, so moving things with your mind, basically. Um, some psychical researchers thought that she could really do this under controlled conditions, um, but uh, some people were also skeptical. Uh, Daniel Douglas Hume, it's, it's, it's spelled home, but pronounced like David Hume, the philosopher, was a medium who was apparently never caught cheating and never admitted to cheating. He usually worked in well-lit rooms, too, rather than like dim seance rooms, which was really interesting. And it was reported that similar to uh, Eusapia Palladino, uh, Hume could work, uh, Hume could uh, do things like materialize extra limbs, uh, levitate himself, move objects with his mind, handle hot coals without burning himself. Um, you know, things that magicians do, um, really. Uh, now, mediums who wanted to enhance their act in such a way as Palladino had enhanced her act after caught cheating, or, well, really, we could say that Palladino was caught cheating uh, because she was enhancing her act, right? <laughs> mediums who wanted to enhance their act did have a lot of tools at their disposal, even in the late 19th century. So big, heavy drapes uh, that could be moved uh, with hidden apparatus, trumpets that could play themselves, luminous paint, so glow-in-the-dark paint, uh, spirit writing slates. These are really interesting. These are two slates uh, that apparently have nothing on them, and then the medium puts them together, and there's a message written. Uh, so it's two, like, double-sided miniature chalkboards, basically. This is actually a magic trick that you can look up on the internet and learn how to do. Uh, you don't need slates. You could use pieces of paper, but the point is that... Um, uh, if mediums are using uh, magic powers to talk to the dead using these slates, they're, they're really doing it the hard way. The easier way is the way magicians do it, which is with sleight of hand. Now, um, so they had other such instruments. They were widely available, and they were often used by parlor magicians as well as mediums. What is a parlor magician? Well, a parlor magician is kind of in between... A close-up magician, like David Blaine, who does magic for a couple of people uh, who are right there with the magician. And stage magic, which is like David Copperfield on a big stage in Las Vegas doing something. So parlor magic is like uh, the kind of magic you might do at a small party or gathering. With around the same number of people as a seance, in fact. Magicians knew of these effects. Magicians still know how many of these effects are accomplished. Uh, and uh, continue to point out when um, mediums, um, you know, claims are suspect, as we'll see in a moment. Now, um, we don't actually know uh, to what, to the, the extent to which mediums in the 19th century used such um, enhancements, but I would suspect it was all the time. Um, skeptics also claimed and still claim to this day, that any medium who has been caught cheating um, or admitted to cheating should be assumed to have always been cheating. And that might sound a little harsh to you, but, um, I mean, really, if, if, you, if you look at it this way, I mean, first of all, if these powers are real, why would anyone need to cheat or enhance their abilities? They would not, one assumes. Um, and secondly... Um, magicians accomplished these same illusions and effects without any claim to um, having supernatural powers or paranormal abilities. So one is inclined to doubt that mediums really are talking to the dead here. And uh, modern technology makes this kind of cheating even easier. I mean, I remember in the late 90s and early 2000s, 
there was a kind of a renewed wave of this stuff. There's one every few decades. Um, there's been a big interest, uh, there was a big interest in things like channeling and fortune telling in the 90s. You might remember seeing commercials um, uh, for Miss Cleo, for example, a tarot card reader who uh, would read your tarot cards if you called 1-800, um, well, 1-800-MISS-CLEO, I guess, <laughs> and spent some money, um, you know, um, talking to her on the phone. You could get a tarot card reading, right? Um, uh, other mediums, John Edward, uh, James Van Prague, uh, Sylvia Brown, um, all quite recent examples of the same kinds of um, what is likely trickery uh, as 19th century mediums. Even outside of the field of mediumship, you find, you find people cheating in this way. Uh, on slide number eight, I've got a link to um, a brief clip from a documentary about the magician uh, James Randi, who uh, kind of works as a, uh, you know, a paranormal investigator, if you will. He investigates these paranormal claims and, and um, finds instances where people are being fraudulent. And he did this once very famously um, with a faith healer named Peter Popoff. Now, P Peter Popoff... Uh, is a faith healer, which means he's a kind of evangelical Christian who practices this laying on of hands. Uh, and the belief here is that the Holy Spirit uh, heals you of your illness. Uh, your illness might be physical, mental, whatever. But the idea is that, um, uh, well, I'm sh maybe this is the way Popoff would put it himself, but the idea is literally that someone like Popoff is an instrument of God, healing the sick, like how Jesus of Nazareth um, uh, was said to have performed miracles and healed the sick, uh, you know, giving sight to the blind and curing the lepers and, and so on and so forth. Popoff was able to single out members of his audience um, without having met them, and, and he would know their names, he would know their medical conditions, um, he would know a lot about their backgrounds. And it seemed as though, it must have seemed so to his followers, that... Um, uh, Popoff had some kind of power to know these things and to heal them, um, uh, which, you know, was, was really like uh, the Holy Spirit or something at work, right? Um, what it turned out was happening, uh, right, uh, and James Randi found this out when he was asked to investigate, um, uh, what was asked to investigate Popoff, uh, was that he was having his audience fill out these prayer cards before his faith healing sessions. The audience would provide personal details on the prayer cards, and his wife would communicate to Peter Popoff via this wireless earpiece, these personal details, to create the illusion that Popoff really knew things that he could not have known without these divine powers. Um, so Popoff was disgraced. Uh, he was... Um, he was exposed as a fraud, um, suffered financial ruin, although in recent years he is back. Um, uh, he sells miracle water now, um, so... Mm. So what Popoff was doing is something that um, magicians actually call hot reading. Hot reading is when you gather information beforehand uh, to create this illusion um, that you have some kind of psychic power, right? And we can contrast this with cold reading, right? Cold reading is gathering information uh, kind of on the spot, like as you're doing a, a reading um, and using this in information to create the illusion that you have uh, mentalistic or psychic powers. So hot reading is something like what Popoff was doing with the prayer cards, you know, gathering information beforehand, and then his wife would tell him the necessary information in his ear, and he would uh, find the audience member and do the laying on of hands. Cold reading would be something like what John Edwards would do uh, on his old television show, Crossing Over. Um, he would say, um, uh, I'm getting, uh, I'm hearing uh, the, the, some spirit is here, uh, and his name begins with a B. And then an audience member might say, my grandfather Bob, passed away last year. Um, 
And then afterwards, it seems to that person, oh, he, he knew it was my grandfather, Bob, who was trying to communicate with me. No, um, this poor unsuspecting person gave the medium that information, right? And then because of the way human memory works, it is recalled differently after the fact. So that's an example of cold reading. Now, I'm not trying to be overly harsh here, right? I'm not necessarily saying that all mediums are cheating all the time. Although, I highly suspect that many mediums do cheat, because I've seen it happen. Um, but, um, sometimes people simply misinterpret what's going on, right? They, they experience illusions, hallucinations, errors in perception, errors of judgment. And, you know, a seance room is an ideal place for this to happen. Um, there is a parapsychologist, for example, named um, uh, Richard Weissman, uh, who's, he's like a skeptical parapsychologist. So he did, the, he did an experiment uh, using um, these fake seances in these fake seance rooms, right? So there's an actor present in these experiments. Um, and he would claim, the actor would claim that they saw a table levitating when it was in fact still on the ground. Um, so here the actor is a bit like a plant. The actor is not the experimenter, but another, um, another person that all the other part participants think is also a participant, right? And this actor claims this table is levitating. Uh, other objects are moved around um, in the dark. Uh, they're marked with luminescent paint and they're moved with a stick so that they appear to move on their own. Now, interestingly, um, in Wiseman's experiment, uh, one third of the participants reported that the table had moved, the table that the actor had claimed levitated. One third claimed that it had moved, even though it had not. Probably owing to uh, some kind of mix-up between seeing other objects moving, these uh, shapes with luminous paint moving because they were being pushed in the dark by somebody with a stick. Um, but the interesting thing is that of the people that reported the table moving, there were many more believers in the paranormal in that group than disbelievers. So what seems to be going on here is twofold. People are mistakenly recalling what they see, and their background beliefs, the beliefs they bring to this scenario, are influencing how they remember what happened and how they evaluate what happened. So this is to say that people can be mistaken, right? I mean, some mediums are no doubt engaging in fraud. That is, um, nobody should... No one should have a problem with that statement because it's demonstrably true. Um, that's not to say all mediums are cheating. Many people, including the mediums themselves, are just mistaken. Um, I mean, look, intuition exists and some people um, may rely on their intuition to do um, psychic reading instead of cold reading or hot reading. They may be cold reading without even realizing that's what they're doing right? And misattributing this to some kind of, um, some kind of psychic power. Um, but it's, it's, it's not an open question. Mediums have been caught cheating before, and even if a medium hasn't been caught cheating, it does not mean that that medium or that psychic is not deceiving themselves in addition to, um, the people who are coming to them for their services. So, now, a lot of um, Victorian scientists ignored uh, this spiritualism craze, but a few took it seriously. One person who uh, took it very seriously was the British chemist William Crookes. You might remember him from Hyman's paper. Uh, he was discussed a little bit in that paper, the, the reading for my lecture on um, parapsychology and the paranormal. So Crookes claimed to have taken photographs of spirits, and he was convinced that the powers of the medium we met earlier, Hume, uh, implied the existence of this new kind of energy or force that was unknown to physics at the time. And scientists, uh, or even in general, rational folks at the time were not immune to believing in this kind of thing. Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, um, the uh, writer of the stories about Sherlock Holmes, this eminently rational Sherlock Holmes believed in fairies, of all things. And um, there were these fake fairy photographs circulating at the time. I'll, I'll put one here that purported to show the existence of fairies. You know, photography was kind of new at the time. 
So people were presenting these photographs as evidence that fairies really existed, and it was taken seriously because photography was still very new and thought of as a very powerful investigative tool. People weren't open to the idea of fakery yet. And none other than Sir Arthur Conan Doyle was duped by these fairy photos. So um, uh, Crooks was another one of these folks. Um, what was the motivation for thinkers like Crooks, though? Um, well, Blackmore seems to think that it's antagonism towards materialism or physicalism. And it's not really hard to appreciate why she feels this way, either. If you consider the, uh, again, sorry to, you, sorry to get punny, but if you think about the zeitgeist of the 19th century, the spirit of the times, um, there was a lot of stuff that was unnerving about what science was uh, teaching us about the natural world, right? In the 19th century, for example, physics was enormously powerful. It was an enormously successful tool. We were starting to explain really, really cool phenomena like electricity and electromagnetism in the 19th century, stuff that had been mysterious and associated with divine powers for millennia. We were finally starting to explain it scientifically, and it left no room for um, anything non-physical, the physics of the 19th century. No room for God or the soul or spirits. When the philosopher Nietzsche said God is dead and we have killed him, this is very much the kind of thing he was talking about, this threat uh, toward um, our traditional way of understanding the world, which is rooted in religious understanding in the face of what science is telling us about how the world works, right? Um, and not to mention, uh, it's not just physics. In the late 19th century, Darwin had published his book on the origin of species, which kind of threatened to take away uh, this, um, you know, this idea that humans were special, that we had a special place in creation. Copernicus had done this before by arguing that the Earth was not at the center of the solar system, and Darwin did it again by showing that uh, humans were not created as we are today, but that we evolved from lower life forms. So um, some people at the time, including uh, perhaps William Crookes, claimed that um, these paranormal or supernatural forces existed because it, um, it provided evidence for some of the things that materialism denied. Evidence for life after death, for example. It offered an alternative to materialism. But not everyone uh, was on board with that. Michael Faraday, a famous, sci a famous physicist, uh, physicist and chemist and um, science demonstrator as well at the time, <clears throat> realized that if these uh, psychical phenomena were real, they would have enormous implications for science. Um, it, enormous implications for how we understand how the universe works, if they were true. So how did he tackle this? Well, Faraday wanted to know if there was anything really going on uh, worth studying in these seances, or whether um, it was just being accomplished by fakery, since some mediums, like Palladino or the Fox sisters, had been caught or had admitted to cheating. So... Um, Faraday would visit these seances, and again, you know, picture of a seance here, we've got everybody around the table laying their hand on the table. This particular kind of seance is called a table-turning seance, and what would happen here is that everyone places their hands on the table, and the table would move as if a ghost was communicating with the people at the seance. Now, Faraday, of course, suspected foul play here, so he devised these cards and this type of cement, almost like a rubber cement, uh, that he could use to work out how, um, you know, how things were moving, how people's hands and the tables were moving in these, um, in these table-turning seances. So what he did was he would take these cards and attach them to the table via cement, and then individuals would place their hands on the cards, not directly on the table. And after the seance was over, by examining how the cement looked on the cards, Faraday could tell whether the table had moved or whether the person's hand had moved, or really what had moved first. Did the table move first or did people's hands move first? There was no question 
when Faraday started examining the results of his experiment, examining the way the cement looked on these cards. The cement was smudged around exactly as you, as you would expect if people's hands were moving first, not if the table was moving on its own. So, how can we explain this? Well, people were moving the table with their hands, but they didn't seem to be aware that they were doing so. And there's actually a name for this effect. It's called the idiomotor effect, and these are unconscious motor movements. We do them all the time, and they, uh, they explain a lot of these anomalistic things, like seances, even dowsing. For example, you know, some people claim that they can find water uh, or minerals or uh, things in the ground using a um, you know, dowsing rod or a witching stick or a pendulum. It's been shown that this is the idiomotor effect. Um, people are moving their hands, which are moving these devices, even though they're not consciously aware that they are doing so. And this is a well-documented effect. But of course, supernatural phenomena in this vein, you know, talking to the spirits of the dead, have persisted. Um, you know, um, not just Faraday uh, was busy debunking these kinds of things, but a little bit later, so was Harry Houdini, the famous magician. Uh, more recently, James Randi, and even more recently, magicians like Penn and Teller or Chris Angel um, and Darren Brown as well uh, have uh, very effectively demonstrated that these apparently supernatural or paranormal things like, you know, the you know, purported cases of people talking to the dead um, or, or, you know, divining information using ESP can be accomplished with cold reading, hot reading, and other, um, you know, apparatus that magicians regularly use. Nowadays, of course, um, one of the biggest uh, examples of this kind of thing, of talking to the dead, is not the seance, but the Ouija board. So I'll put the picture of the Ouija board up here. But it basically has this uh, little pointer that everyone puts their hands on, and it moves around, and the idea is that it's a spirit or something uh, that is communicating a message through the Ouija board by having everyone move their hands um, and spelling out messages or answering yes or no to yes or no questions. It's really interesting. Um, the, the, the word Ouija actually comes from the French oui for yes and the German ja for yes. So it's, I guess technically it should be oui ja, but it's Ouija. Um, because it's been kind of anglicized. So when we use the Ouija board, if you have, uh, is that really spirits communicating with you, or is there a simpler explanation? Um, well, there is a simple explanation for how Ouija boards work, and as you may have already guessed, it's the same explanation that Faraday appealed to when he tried to explain the table turnings during these seances. And it is, in fact, the idiomotor effect. How do we know? Well, I'm going to talk about a really interesting empirical study that was done by Talia Wheatley and, Talia Wheatley and Daniel Wegner, two psychologists who work on uh, freedom of the will and intentional volition and these kinds of things. And their research shows how um, the idiomotor effect uh, might play a role in how people who tend to believe in the paranormal, evaluate what happens um, when they use a Ouija board. So let's take a look at that now. All right, so we've been talking about the idiomotor effect, which is this <clears throat> phenomenon that happens where we move, we make movements unconsciously, uh, moving our hands, so on and so forth, uh, without being consciously aware that we are doing so. And it turns out that there are quite a lot of interesting cases where this um, experience of will or volition uh, or a lack of experience of will and volition can accompany uh, conscious or unconscious movements. There's a lot of cases how uh, basically our actual actions and the sense that we are the author of those actions can kind of become disentangled or decoupled. This happens in the idiomotor effect, but it also happens in a couple of other curious cases, like, for example, cases of precognitive arousal. These were studied by a neuroscientist named William Gray Walter in the 1950s. Basically, what he did was something like this, where he had these electrodes implanted in the motor cortices of his patients. 
and they had them sitting in front of a slide projector. Now, his participants were supposed to press a button every time they wanted to change a slide on the projector screen. Now, unbeknownst to the participants, um, the slide was not changing with the button presses. What the slide was actually doing was changing uh, owing to the result of activity in the motor cortex that was being detected and then amplified by these electrodes. So the, the patients reported this startling effect where, uh, you know, they were just about to, um, just about to push the button and then the slide changed on its own right before they were going to press the button. So under certain conditions, we can be in control of actions without actually feeling like we're in control of actions. And um, Gray Walter's work here on precognitive arousal is a really great example of that. And that's the same kind of thing that's going on in the idiomotor effect. We are initiating actions, but we are not consciously aware that that's what we're doing. And if you were skeptical, like, well, how can we unconsciously initiate actions? Well, this example from Gray Walter is another example of that, right? It's, it's a very clear example of unconscious action initiation, albeit a kind of artificial one. It's an example of how this kind of thing can happen. So, um, sometimes uh, this, this, this uh, oh, sense that we are the author of our actions, this sense of agency or volition can also become decoupled from our actual actions uh, in cases of schizophrenia. And not just our actions, but thoughts as well. So schizophrenics sometimes report that they believe their actions aren't initiated by themselves. Uh, their actions are maybe initiated by someone else. Um, this could be an alien or a demon, a malevolent spirit, or even somebody they, they know and that they think is out to get them. Um, some even report that their thoughts are not their own, that not just some of their actions, but some of their thoughts were somehow asserted, inserted into their minds um, by some kind of nefarious force. And you can imagine that this um, disconnect must be quite disturbing to those who experience it. Now, can it happen the other way around? Um, can we have the feeling that we've um, caused an event uh, even when we haven't. Yes, we can. Okay. Uh, Daniel Wegner kind of ironically, I guess, uses Ouija boards to demonstrate this, even though what's really going on in a typical Ouija board session is the idiomotor effect. Um, <coughs> Wegner used a kind of Ouija board-like experiment to work out that the opposite can be true. We can feel like we've caused an action even when we haven't caused one. So, um, he proposes that this, uh, that I mean, uh, well, this is an important thing about Wegner, actually, I should say first, is that Wegner was famous for claiming that our experience of free will is an illusion. So the sense that we are the cause of our own actions is an illusion. It is, to quote Wegner, actually the mind's best trick. Um, <clears throat> so the experience of free will is created um, in, in three stages, according to Wegner, where we have... Um, the parts of the brain planning actions um, and preparing to carry them out. And then in the next stage, we have becoming aware of thinking about performing the action. We could call this the intention. So we have a kind of unconscious preparation, a conscious intention, and then an action, which is the third stage, which follows the intention. But the action has to occur close enough together so that the uh, so that we feel like, or that we conclude, that our intention is what caused or initiated the action. <clears throat> so, um, Wegner thinks there are these three requirements that we need uh, for the experience of willing an action to occur. Uh, we need the thought occurring before the action. We need um, the thought to be consistent with the action, or the intention to be consistent with the action. And we need it not to be accompanied by other causes. So to investigate this, uh, Wegner and Wheatley did a really interesting experiment using a Ouija board-like apparatus, where they would have the pointer replaced by a 20 centimeter square board mounted on a computer mouse. So the mouse moved on a screen that displayed 50 small objects. <clears throat> the experiment tested 
51 undergraduate participants, but what these participants didn't know was that they were actually being paired with an experimental confederate. So we'll call our two students here uh, Dan and Jane. Let's call the participant Dan and the confederate Jane. So Dan and Jane are sitting there facing each other with their hands on this cursor board over this screen that would have been flat, like, like a table, with, but it was a, a computer screen instead. And there are different objects displayed on the screen. They have to move the cursor over the objects, and they have to stop every 30 seconds and rate how strong their intention was to make each stop. Now, during each trial, words were played through these headphones that Dan and Jane were each wearing. Then music would play uh, for 10 seconds, indicating they should stop. Now, Dan thinks that Jane is hearing the same thing that he is. Remember, Jane is the confederate, and Dan is the only actual experimental participant. So Dan thinks um, uh, Jane is hearing something similar. He thinks Jane is hearing different words in her headphones, but Dan is still meant to think that Jane is hearing the series of words followed by music to indicate that they should stop uh, moving the cursor board. What Jane is actually hearing is instructions about which, which movements she's supposed to make from the experimenter. So in four of these trials, Jane is actually told to stop on an object, for example, a swan, while Dan is hearing the music. So Dan would hear the word swan 30 seconds before, 5 seconds before, 1 second before, or 1 second after Jane stopped on the swan. So that's what's happening in each of these four trials, respectively. In the other trials, none of, the, none of the stops were forced in this way. So the participant, Dan, had to give, the, uh, give agreement ratings uh, with statements like, I intended to make the stop. And interestingly, Dan gives the highest agreement ratings uh, with the statement, I intended to make the stop, when the word came either one second or five seconds before Jane stopped moving the cursor board. Participants give the lowest agreement ratings when the stop occurs 30 seconds before or one second after Jane stops after Dan hears the swan. So Wagner calls this the priority principle, this effect that he uncovered in this experiment with Talia Wheatley. Uh, the priority principle says that effects are experienced as willed when the relevant thoughts occur just before them. Um, something similar is probably happening with a Ouija board or with uh, table turning seances insofar as that the relevant thoughts for action initiation or to, to get this experience of will are not occurring in those situations. So we don't have conscious intentions to move when we're at a table turning seance or in a Ouija board session as we do here in this experiment uh, when Dan hears, uh, hears the right word before he actually stops on the swan. So in kind of what's going on here is Dan is confabulating an intention to stop. Really, it's Jane who stops. Um, and if he hears the right word, you know, swan, at the right time, five seconds or one second before he stops, um, he kind of, uh, his mind kind of plays a trick on himself and kind of writes this experience for him that he willed to stop on the swan at the time that he did, even though he didn't really. Um, so anyway, the priority principle may explain, um, <clears throat> may explain what is going on in cases of the idiomotor effect uh, in that we don't have the right kinds of relevant thoughts or intentions um, making it into our conscious mind before um, these actions are actually initiated, whether it's moving the pointer on a Ouija board or uh, moving a table at a seance. Very interesting to think about any, anyway. So, um, and, and generally Wegner and Wheatley's results are very cool because they show that we can uh, elicit this experience of will even when one hasn't actually decided anything, which is kind of interesting because it has implications for the debate over whether we have free will. And if you've read this entire chapter, all of chapter nine from Blackmore, uh, and not just the end bit here, then you'll, you'll, you'll be aware of that. So um, we can set aside questions like um, uh, whether freedom of the will exists um, in this class. But what is interesting is uh, how this might also explain 
why people or why some people at any rate feel that they can uh, influence events with their thoughts. You know, this, this was the case in early uh, PK research when experimenters tried to see if people could influence dice rolls or uh, random number generators with their thoughts. Well, some people believe they can influence the events of, um, you know, uh, influence certain events, say, uh, you know, influence whether a sports uh, team that they like will win if they cheer hard enough, right? Or if you're at the craps table, right, and you're rolling the dice, uh, or my favorite example is playing Wheel of Fortune, right? You know, when you watch Wheel of Fortune, if, if you watched Wheel of Fortune, someone will sometimes spin the wheel and yell, come on, big money, big money, you know, like that kind of thing, right? So, um, perhaps the priority principle can also explain in some sense why some people believe they can influence things with their thoughts. But when it comes to Ouija boards and seances, um, I think uh, the priority principle and the research of folks like Wegner is most important because it illustrates that um, we can have the experience of willing something or causing an action even when we haven't, and we can cause an action even when we don't have the experience of doing so, which is what happens with the idiomotor effect. And the idiomotor effect very nicely explains what happens in table-turning seances and in Ouija board sessions. So, um, that's it for talking about Wegner and Wheatley. Why don't we wrap it up for the day? So this has been kind of a longer lecture than I imagined it would. I didn't think I would. I didn't think I would have enough material to talk about, really, because, um, well, I've gotten a few questions from you about what kinds of supplementary material you uh, you might be interested in reading. Uh, I'll be honest. I've had a hard time finding any. Um, this is not a. Um, this is not the usual kind of topic you discuss in a philosophy class, I suppose, but. Uh, in any case, uh, we've had a good chat today about whether we can talk to the spirits of the dead. And as you can probably tell, I'm very skeptical about this. Um, unfortunately, human beings, including, of course, mediums and psychics and faith healers and so on and so forth, can be dishonest. But even if they're not being dishonest, they can certainly be mistaken. And certainly... Um, People that seek the services of mediums and psychics to communicate with the dead can also be mistaken. Um, I think this is probably rather harmless um, in most cases. Not cases, though, uh, where people are charging money for this kind of service. If you want to uh, play around with a Ouija board or play around with some tarot cards or whatever, I mean, more power to you. That's fine can be kind of fun, right? Even, I don't, I don't believe in that stuff, but I can see how it'd be kind of fun to do that. Dark room, it's all spooky, have a Ouija board session. It probably is pretty fun, just like ghost hunting or looking for UFOs is probably pretty fun. Um, but when you talk about folks charging people money to communicate with their dead relatives, um, that's just slimy to me. Uh, and, and I don't know how any honest person can, you know, can take advantage of people in such a way. And I think that's very unfortunate. So, you know, there is, however, a big draw here, right? There is something very, very powerful about the idea of talking to the dead. Obviously, many of us have lost friends and loved ones um, and it would be great to talk to them again. I mean, wouldn't it? Uh, as, a, as a skeptic and an atheist, of course it would be great to talk to a friend or a relative that you've lost. Of course it would. It would be awesome. And I've thought about what I would say to um, relatives. I, I think often of my mother's parents who passed, especially my grandmother, uh, who I was very close with. And um, I often think of, uh, if I were to have a conversation with her now, uh, what we would talk about, what, you know, tell, I wish I could tell her all the things I, I'm up to these days. I wish I could tell her that I got my PhD and whatnot. That would be so nice. But it's just not a possibility, um, so far as I can tell, given the evidence I've looked at. And that's unfortunate, but... I think it's something we all have to live with, frankly. Now, 
this is obviously so compelling that this is why people pay money um, for the services of, of um, you know, Miss Cleo or Sylvia Brown or James Van Prague or one of these people. But I think uh, if I were to give you my advice as a philosopher and a scientist, I would say save your money. Do save your money. Um, you are being taken advantage of in these situations, and that is unfortunate. If, however, money is not involved and you feel like you might get a bit of closure doing something like this with a friend or with a Ouija board or with some tarot cards by yourself, sure, I don't believe that, that there's anything to it, but you might find that a valuable experience. And I think that's okay, just as long as nobody is taking advantage of you because of it. Okay? Um, so, also we've seen today that there are more parsimonious explanations for what's going on during seances and Ouija board sessions than actually talking to the dead. What that means is that, um, well, the simplest answer is usually the correct one, right? Like Occam's razor. Actually, what Occam's razor really states is, do not multiply entities beyond necessity. The fewer theoretical entities you have in your theory, um, the better. Given, given the option of one theory that's very complex um, but posits a lot of theoretical entities or one that does just as good a job, explanatorily speaking, but is much simpler, go with the simpler one. And what I mean by that is like, sure, it might be the case that substance dualism is true and maybe we just haven't solved the mind-body problem yet, but minds are some extended substance that is the soul that exists but that we can't study with uh, the tools of methodological naturalism. Yeah, that could be true. Or um, people could just be mistaken and psychics and mediums could just be fraudulent. Um, Occam's razor, right? And I know that's disappointing to hear if you believe in this stuff, but it's how science works. This is an important principle. This idea of parsimony in science is a very powerful uh, and important principle within science. And I know you all trust science because you all have computers and cell phones. And if it weren't for science, I couldn't be delivering these lectures to you. And you're watching these lectures. So, mm -hmm. anyway, um, <clears throat> maybe, maybe for reasons like this, this is why J.B. Ryan and his wife, Louise, didn't look and, at, um, you know, ghostly stuff. Uh, they looked at uh, whether... Um, <clears throat> people in the general population might have latent psychic abilities, but they did not uh, ask whether ghosts existed. They didn't um, investigate mediums or people who claim to have special powers like a lot of earlier um, uh, psychical research did. So maybe that's why the Rhines did that. In any case, that's some interesting food for thought. So there's a lot here to potentially talk about for uh, critical response number two. Keep in mind, you can write uh, critical response number two on this lecture, or you can write it on the next lecture, which is about ESP and psychokinesis. And I will hopefully have that up soon. I am still catching up a little bit. Um, now, uh, the next lecture will draw primarily from chapter 21 of Blackmore. I don't think I will offer any other readings for that one. But don't forget, as you're thinking about uh, your critical response, whether you'll respond to this lecture and these readings or the next one and the associated readings for that lecture, don't forget to keep thinking about your essay topic suggestions and what you might like to write for an essay because um, uh, this, uh, this essay deadline will come sooner rather than later, right? That's just how it goes. Anyhow, uh, that's all I have for you today. Um, I hope you're all hanging in there. I've finished grading your critical responses, by the way. Many of them were very, very good, very thoughtful. I was really interested by a lot of what I read. And I hope you find my feedback helpful when it comes to preparing your next critical response. In the meantime, um, you know, stay safe, study hard. Uh, let me know if you have any questions about the material. And I will see you next time for our lecture on ESP and psychokinesis. All right. Have a good one, everybody.